Praise the Lord again and welcome back. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this opportunity to continue in your word. I pray for those who are here, O oh God. I pray that you would continue to move by your spirit, Lord Jesus, and strengthen and encourage Sister Shonda, O oh God, as only you can in the name of Jesus. Help us to do our part, Lord, to strengthen and encourage the believers. Help us to do our part, Lord, to be the salt and light you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, Lord, it is your anointing that makes the difference. Lord, send that anointing into the hospital rooms where souls are languishing, O oh God. Have mercy and grant peace that only you can by your presence. Move by your spirit, O oh God, to comfort. In the name of Jesus, Lord, use us as you called us to do and be, to be your hands, O oh God, that touch others. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Again, I want to pick up where I left off a little earlier dealing with the foundations. We've already read over in the 11th chapter of the book of Psalms for those of you that are kind of playing catch up. Just as a recap, over in Psalm chapter number 11, we picked up at verses number 1 through 5, 6, 7. So Psalms 11 and 1 through 7, we dealt with the foundations definition. The foundation is a purpose. It's a place. It's a position. It's a place where consideration is brought about. It's the place where we take a stand and build. Foundations represent a solid place on which to erect a type of structure or building. Foundation is what is required for salvation today. And that salvation is based in the foundation of the apostles and prophets that we are built upon, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So in Psalm chapter number 11, verses 1 through 7, they read thus, In the Lord I put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Verse number 2, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily, and remember privily means by dusk or darkness or out of obscurity where you really can't be made out for what you are. And what they do from that position is they shoot at the upright in heart. Verse 3 is the key. If the foundations, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The point of the wicked shooting arrows at those who are upright in heart is to look for holes in their testimony, is to expose some form of hypocrisy in the truth that is being given that they don't want to embrace. So what we need to understand is we must remain upon the foundations that we're built upon, which is of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Everything that we lay that we call the gospel must start and end with what Jesus gave the disciples who became apostles. And what he gave them is that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He said that these signs shall follow them that believe. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll cast out devils. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I've seen the Pito Shama. I've seen these powerful workings of God firsthand. So the Bible bears witness to the truth, and I have beheld with my own eyes these workings in the Holy Ghost. So I know that the Bible is true. The other testimony that's most great is that the speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God giveth the utterance is the evidence of the power and presence of God in my life. And when God enters into these mortal bodies, with his eternal spirit, by the power of the Holy Ghost, oh, you know there's a change. You who receive it, we who receive it, know that there's a great change that is wrought by the power and presence of God in these mortal beings. Hallelujah. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for the Holy Ghost. Now, along with that comes discernment the Holy Ghost brings. It helps us to see what is real and what's falsetta. And many times to tap into that, so to speak, we need to make sure that we're walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. In the spirit, we can discern things of the spirit. In the flesh, we discern the carnal things. 
And we miss many times the spiritual things because we're not walking in the spirit. So we're not led of the spirit. So we're not easily in tune with the spirit. And let me say this, you can have the Holy Ghost, be baptized in Jesus' name, speaking in tongues like the rest of us, and still be living a wicked life. And since gifts and callings are, not, are without repentance, you can continue to operate in the gift that God gave in the Holy Ghost, and yet yourself still be lost. Paul said it this way, I take heed to myself, lest that after I minister to others, that I myself should become a castaway. Now, you'll find later on with the other scriptures that I go to is that the point is being made that God makes himself through the Old Testament that he reveals true in Paul in the New Testament is the warnings to the people of God. People who belong to God today are folk baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, who speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God giveth the utterance, who live holy and overcoming lives subsequent to the powerful act of being born of the water and of the Spirit. Everybody needs to be born of the water and of the spirit. But since the foundations are all out of order, they're out of order in regards to the gospel being preached in its truth and sincerity as it once was and was always commanded to so be done. People are reinterpreting the scripture. They're using liberal translations of the scriptures. And because of that, there comes a subsequent error of the interpretations of the word of God because of such liberal wording that is used that allows people to go astray who are not versed in the scriptures. People who are versed in the scriptures are the ones who have the knowledge of the word of God with which God has given understanding and confirmation, especially in and through the word along with the presence of God in the power of the Holy Ghost. Why do I make that point? You have many Bible scholars today who are very well versed in the scriptures who are not saved. If this gospel be hid, it is hid to them who are lost. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. So you can read the Bible and not believe the right portions of the scripture and come away with error, believing you have truth. And it will take the grace and mercy of God along with the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection to bring about a level of understanding and conviction that can bring a person to the place where he or she recognizes the need to repent change their minds and change their directions and opinions of what the scriptures say, no matter who it was that taught them that which was in error. When I didn't know truth, I believed what was taught to me in error. But even in error, there was an introduction made to me of the Bible. So with that respect or regard, I stayed in the Bible and I heard the gospel preached, and that alone brought salvation and a knowledge to the truth that is written in the scriptures. You can read the Bible from cover to cover, and without the understanding that only God gives, you can come away lost and very well versed in the memorization of the words themselves. I listened to a man last night talking about the Holy Ghost, but he didn't explain that everybody needed it. But he was a pastor of a missionary Baptist church, so I understand. But I was saying to a person I conversed with that I had more respect for that pastor who was trying to teach the Bible according to what he knew and understood versus a believer who hides in a church where they don't have the whole truth and they're not living an overcoming victorious holy life that might set an example for those who are lost in their midst. I think it's a sin and a disgrace when apostolic people go hide in churches where people don't have the whole truth and they neglect to tell them the truth and sit there and go along with the level of faith that those people have knowing they're living beneath the privilege of the power and presence of God. That is shameful. What's worse than that is for apostolics to make people who are not apostolic in their faith and exercise to the measure of being full of the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name, treating them as our equals. A lot of apostolics run with the Church of God and Christ people. Those people don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe that Jesus is one of three people in the Godhead. There is not three gods operating as one God. There is one God who manifests himself in many ways. He didn't just manifest himself as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He was the God in the burning bush. He was the God in the cloud that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness. He was the God in the pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness in the darkness of the night. 
He was that same God that appeared to Moses in a burning bush. God can show up anywhere in any way that he wants to, but he is one. He made it clear to the children of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And he is the one to be worshipped with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's Deuteronomy chapter number 6 for those of you who are keeping score and want to make notes. And while I'm thinking about it, let me encourage those of you who know both me and Ella Dwayne Odom. He made some very salient points over his last couple of messages. One of them he dealt with the testimony of a brother who left this world shortly after he received the Holy Ghost. But one of the points he made about the night that man received the Holy Ghost is that he kept people in the man's presence so he wouldn't feel alone. The Lord brought that to my remembrance tonight when I was at the hospital earlier. And to those of you who were tuned in then, I apologize because there seemed to be a whole lot of stuff going on tonight more than even the last time we were there. Machines everywhere, people everywhere, staff everywhere, intermittent connections. I didn't know what was going on. But I didn't want to cheat those of you who depend on these scriptures for your encouragement to get intermittent message. And I apologize for that. So that's why I'm coming back on now. Normally I'd be in a bed by now, but your soul is important to God. So me making a sacrifice of staying up, it's worth it just so you be encouraged to understand that the foundations are out of order. In the church and outside of the church. In the world and outside of the world. Everything's out of order. I was noticing today, even at work, you go outside, you breathe the air coming in through the air conditioning. Even for this to be pollen season, it's very unusual. And I've been hearing things about the cloud seeding, where they say the government has the ability to put stuff in the atmosphere that changes weather patterns. I don't know how true that is, but I'll say this to you. Normally, when there's an allergy season here in Mississippi where I live, the congestion is normal. The hoarseness of the throat is normal. Even when it comes to the running of the nose, all those things are normal for individuals who suffer in that manner. But for those of us who normally don't suffer to the same extent that others do, I find myself suffering in ways that I never did before. There's something wrong. There's something unusual in the atmosphere. That's not the message, but I want you to take the parallel of that. There's something wrong in the atmosphere of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some things have changed. The foundations have been shifted. What people are majoring in is very minor, and what's very major, people are minoring in. It is major to have an understanding of the word of God. It is major to know the truth of the salvation of God. It is major to understand the oneness of God. It is even more major to understand that that one God is coming back very soon. And he's only coming back for those of us who have made ourselves ready. We've already repented of our sins. We've already submitted to water baptism in Jesus' name where we took on the name of Jesus. We've already been renewed and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, which came with the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God giveth the utterance just like it did on the day of Pentecost according to the second chapter of the book of Acts. It was prophesied by Jesus in the 16th chapter of the book of Mark. You're taking notes. Write it down. Check for yourself. The word of God is true. Our problem today is we have many translations which water down the truth of the word of God. And they're so liberal in the usage of the words that people come away trying to be self-taught. And they end up in error because they don't understand and they wrestle with the scriptures to their own destruction. You need a teacher. You need a preacher. You need one who's been sent by God. And everybody who's teaching and everybody who's preaching, God didn't send them. God sent folk who were baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't send anybody else. Everybody else sent themselves. And if you're one who preaches what you believe to be the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you have not been born again of the water and of the spirit, as I have just described, you need that. Not so we can be in competition. You need that to be in fellowship with me and God. I'm just a mortal. So it's easier for man to communicate with man. But man must communicate with man about Jesus Christ. So you want to commune with God, you need to be born again. 
And I don't say God doesn't speak to sinners. He can speak to whoever he wants, however he wants. He showed me myself before I ever got saved. But you're going to have to hear the gospel preached to be saved. And you're hearing it now. So ask God for the Holy Ghost. Ask God to point you to somewhere you can be baptized in Jesus' name. Contact me. I'll do what I can to help you. But at the end of the day, you're not even in the race if you haven't been born of the water and spirit. And now with that being dealt with, I want to get back to foundations. Foundations are out of order. The priority of the salvation of the souls of mankind, according to the scriptures that reads, After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. Another portion says you shall receive power. Well, I've received power and I am a witness. And you can take my word as we read along in God's word that the truth is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It'll become clear as we move on. So notice this here in verse number three. I got to remind you, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundational truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ are destroyed through the poor witness and testimony of those of us who believe to the detriment of the salvation and faith of those who are watching us, then where does that leave the rest of us who want to be right when the enemy makes us look wrong? Because some of us are wrong. Not everybody that claims the name of Jesus is walking with Jesus. Not everybody who speaks with other tongues even has their sins washed away. Not everybody who preaches apostolic is even apostolic anymore. Why does this matter? Your soul depends upon hearing the truth. You need a teacher and a preacher. We all do. Even us teachers and preachers need teachers and preachers of this same faith. And we operate just like Paul did after he received the Holy Ghost. He went back to Jerusalem and compared notes with the other 11 apostles to make sure that he hadn't run in vain. You look at us today. Nobody can tell us anything. Let me put it to you in the brother J.D. vernacular. Can't nobody tell you nothing, especially when you're apostolic and then you backslide apostolic after your fathers in the gospel are dead and gone and they're the only ones that you respected, so now can't nobody else tell you nothing. Yeah, you. You're wounding the hearts and consciences of men and women who sincerely seek the Lord at the detriment of watching you misrepresent God with the carnal stuff you putting down in Jesus' name. We'll all know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And the fruits of righteousness is what you ought to be able to clearly see in the lives of those of us who claim the name of Jesus. But it'll get clearer to you because you're going to see later on where God even deals with the folk who claim to be the prophets and the preachers of the Lord's message. Verse number four says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Not down here with us. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So if you're wicked, that's what God feels towards you. Yep, full of the Holy Ghost, still talking in tongues. If you're wicked and you love mess, that's how God sees you. Notice this here. Verse number six, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, brimstone and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Talking about the wicked. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. God pays attention, especially to those of us who walk upright. Especially when we make petition of him in, <clears throat> excuse me, our upright condition. Thank you, Lord get some water. Let's turn over to the book of Romans, chapter number 2, verse number 1. I should have had a straw in there. I apologize. Romans chapter number 2, verse number 1 says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. Now, if you really want to understand what's going on here, you're going to have to go back to the first chapter of the book of Romans where you see God not only 
said testified against the folks, said when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and turned the truth of God into a lie. They knew God. You've picked that up in the first chapter of the book of Romans. Now, when you get here to the second chapter, after having made reference to God turning people to reprobate minds, you find out that now he says to us, this is by the voice of the author of the book of Romans, believed to be Paul. He says, we are inexcusable. We have no excuse, whoever we are, that judge folk like that. Like what you read in Romans chapter number one. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges doest the same things. We got folk who preach against stuff they practice. They preach publicly that is wrong and practice it in secret. And for those of you who think I'm just talking about fornication and adultery, no sir, no ma'am. They preach against idolatry, and yet they worship people and things. They preach against covetousness, and yet they run after every dollar with every bit of energy they have, with greed and great desire. But I'll show you what else happens. Verse number three. I didn't finish two, I'm sorry. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You think you're going to get away even after you preach against it? Have we not seen men who got caught with their pants down, so to speak, who claimed to be ministers of the gospel when they got caught, denied it, and ended up dying and leaving here behind diseases that came subsequent to their ungodly practices and wicked ways? We've seen people leave here full of AIDS, full of other diseases, having heart attacks and dying in the bed with people they were not married to. God is not mocked. I don't care how young they are, how cute they are, how eloquent they are, how hard and raspy they can preach till it makes your ears tingle. If they don't live righteously and they set ungodly examples, not only will they perish, but those of you who follow their pernicious ways, the foundations have shifted from holiness to self-indulgence. From service to greed for gain. From righteousness to flat out unrighteousness and wickedness. It's wicked to practice things that God calls abominable and even have the audacity to climb into a pulpit and call yourself a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just as wicked to say amen to people who are guilty of the sins that you're not, and yet you promote them as though they have no sin. It's respect of persons. We'll get to it. Hallelujah. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? God is the one who's good. He's the one who's long-suffering. He's the one who's forbearing. That's on top of all the mess he know we've done, that we will do, and continue to do. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Hallelujah. Verse number five. They left it in there. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, that means you hard-headed and won't repent, Treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What do you think that's going to happen? That happens in the tribulation. But it can also happen in part to individuals who are practicing sin with their eyes wide open who God decides to judge and they run out of time down here before the rapture takes place. A lot of folk are going to leave here before the Lord comes back for the church. A lot of folk have already left here, and the Lord has not come back for the church. What does that mean to you and me? We need to get right and stay right. We need to get on the godly, sound teaching where the foundations of the gospel of Jesus Christ are not being shifted with the new gospel. 
with these new jacks coming on the scene who are not even scholars of the scriptures. They just throw up something and preach out of their imaginations and get people happy and enthused about what they're saying because they believe there's something to be gained and they get people in a carnal mood of looking for stuff and not substance. How do these people draw these huge crowds of folk they don't tell any truth to? Well, the God of this world blinds minds and the God of this world uses people who are wicked people and transforms his ministers into angels of light. It's not unusual for you to find a crooked preacher today, male and female. But the men God called, he called them men. He described them as husbands of one wife. That's extra. Maybe we'll deal with that another time. But that's part of the foundations being shifted. 50 years ago, it was an exception to find a woman trying to operate as a pastor of a church or a congregation or a flock. Women who... But leading you in error. Yeah, I said it. I refer you to the third and fourth chapters of the book of Isaiah for those of you who are willing to go read the scriptures for yourselves. And all of y'all who found yourselves following Deborah for godly advice, I want to remind you, when you go to Judges and you find her judging the children of Israel, they're backslidden. And you look at those of you who are backslidden today. These ungodly, wicked men and women can lead and teach and feed you because your eyes have been blinded because of your own wicked ways. And those of you who are new to this gospel who don't know any better, now you know better. You find yourself a woman trying to pass you, you ought to run up out of there like the building is on fire. You find yourself with a man trying to be a pastor and you know yourself he's had two or three wives and claim to have been saved under each marriage. You run up out of there like the place is on fire. You go to places where you find leaders who have two and three wives and husbands and remarriages. You get away from them. God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And if we as ministers of the gospel can't keep one wife, we are not worthy to preach this gospel. Yeah, I said it and it includes me. I married to the same woman I was married to before I got saved. God kept us together. I was an unfaithful man when I wasn't saved, and my unsaved wife forgave my transgressions and my infidelity, and she stayed with me with no Holy Ghost. She believed in the fidelity of marriage and the sanctity of it when she didn't even have the power of the Holy Ghost. And yet we have folk who are apostolic claiming irreconcilable differences and some telling the truth flat out. They committed sin against their own spouses and some married folk God didn't tell them to marry. And so when they started getting the smack down and the beat down, it became you don't expect God to make them stay in that marriage. And I say no, by all means, get up out of there with the quickness. But I didn't say that God gave you a license to go get you another one because you made the wrong choice with the first one. That's on you, baby. That ain't on God. That pauses for effect. The foundations have shifted, y'all. There was a shame. There was a time when there was a shame for a person to be even divorced and they weren't even in church. This is how much the times have changed. There was a shame when people in secret used to sneak over, over state lines and have illegal abortions and risk their lives and people died doing it because they didn't have proper medical care or they just met with the judgment of God for killing an innocent baby. But either way you slice it, there was a time when that kind of stuff was shameful. There was a time when people were unwed mothers. It was a shame to the whole family and a disgrace and the wit and the pregnant girl was sent away to live with other relatives just to pre preserve the family name. Now folk get pregnant, knocked up and on purpose. Ain't even trying to be married and fine with it. 
Women taking care of trifling men who can't contribute anything to the relationship but sperm. Yeah, donors. That's what they are. Trifling. They're not men of God. And much of this stuff has crept into the churches because people are coming to God out of these several places, but these crooked preachers are not telling you that God is not pleased with that kind of behavior. And if he can't keep the preacher with his wife and they claim to be saved, how's that preacher going to help you stay with your wife? That's not even my notes. Let me get back to my notes. Thank you, Lord. He came to me, so I shared it. Hallelujah. Romans chapter number two, verse number seven, right? I want to back up to verse number six and read it again. Verse number six says, who will render to every man according to his deeds? Verse seven, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and, immor and immortality, for them eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, arguing with everybody, got something smart to say with every preacher that preaches righteousness, and do not obey the truth, that's the same folk who are contentious, but obey unrighteousness, guess what they have reserved for them? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Nobody's getting away with sin and unrighteousness. Be they saved or lost, nobody gets away. That's why salvation is so important. It is the extrication of a sinner from the consequences for his or her life. And it cost a life to give eternal life, and that life was the life of Jesus Christ. So we identify with him in the waters of baptism when we're baptizing his name. We rise to walk in the newness of life when we receive his spirit called the Holy Ghost, which causes us to speak with other tongues as the spirit of God giveth the utterance. I'm telling you because folk are telling you you don't need that to be saved. They're telling you to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you are saved. The Bible says shall be saved. But it goes on to say so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall he preach except he be sent. God ain't sent all these folk who claim to be preaching. We got folk who are saved who are preaching that were not called to it. You might as well know it. And if they're not called to it, it's going to take the grace of God to help them to stay on the straight and narrow and not come up with gimmicks to get people to follow them when they can't take, can't take you very far because they don't know very much. You got folk nowadays, I'm just going to say it. You got folk nowadays who claim to be ministers of the gospel and claim to be pastors who didn't even step foot in Sunday school when they weren't ministers. And when they were ministers, they were the sidekick over there saying amen and wasn't teaching nothing because they weren't learning anything besides listening to the pastor preach. There are many people who are standing up ministering right now. I don't remember seeing them once in Sunday school when I wasn't the minister. And I'm talking about 30 years ago. These folk are jumping up claiming to be pastors. These young folk are jumping up and claiming to be pastors. And they don't even know the scriptures. So they come up with these catchy phrases and they come up with these spurious ideas about prophecy and God is not speaking to them. And if you listen to them, after they lie to you with false prophecy, they make excuses for why it didn't come to pass. And somehow it becomes your fault because you didn't have enough faith in what they told you for God to bring it to pass. Let me help you. When a prophet gets up and tells you what thus saith the Lord, it's going to happen exactly the way they claim God said it if God gave it to them to say it. If it doesn't, it is the measure that they are a lying, false prophet. And if you're following them kind of people, you need to get away from them. Because their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. You'll notice this. You may not like the way I say it, but if you look at a lot of these so-called popular preachers today, you should go back and Google them and take a picture of what they looked like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. 20 years ago when they didn't have a flock and they didn't have anybody following them and they had to go to work every day like me, they weren't so fat. Look at them before they became pastors. They're fleecing the flocks and they're becoming fat cats at the expense of the flock. Look at them for yourself. See what they ask you for versus what they're willing to give you. See, the true pastor is a servant to God's people. 
And sometimes we as servants of God, we bite off more than we can chew. I'm guilty of that. I want to be everywhere God wants me to be and want to help everywhere that I can. But there are some places and some things I've done and been, it wasn't the will of God for me to do there and be that. Wasted God's time and mine too. Then I have to redeem the time by making sure that the time I would have rested, I spent doing what I should have done in the first place. This is part of my frailty. So I ask you, pray for me. I want to be the best servant of God's people I can be, but I also want to make sure I don't take on false burdens and I'm doing exactly what God wants. And it's easier to do that when you fast and pray. Yeah, I pray, but I don't fast as much. But like even today with the fast, I can hear from God better. So I encourage fasting. You hear from God better. Your discernment is sharper. And God, hey, told Ma, God even has a way of allowing you to feel people around you. You notice how the Bible says we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities? We serve a God who knows how we feel. But do you not know that this God who knows how we feel, when we're, walk, when we're walking after the Spirit, God will even allow us to feel how other people feel so that we'll have the right level of compassion and care for them. I learned a lot of that from Elder Odom. That brother's been my teacher most of my saved life. What he taught me as a young believer, I held on to. And what he taught me was the value of the word of God. So I've been a student of the scriptures all my saved life. So when you jump over these jack legs who get up and preach to you, and you feel real good, and you're empty after you leave there, and you still have questions that they don't answer, then why don't you reach out to us over on this side who are living something? We'll help you with your questions. But I'll caution you, we're going to tell you the truth. And you might not like it, but it could save your soul. There are a lot of folk on their primrose road to hell feeling good about what they think is salvation. And they're going to miss the rapture. Because their leaders have shifted the priorities of the gospel to something strange and different. Foundation. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Psalm 81. While you're going there, I want to encourage you to come back and read up into verse number. You're going to need to read the whole first and second chapter of the book of Romans, to be honest with you. Because remember, we're dealing with shifting foundations, and this is a cautionary message. So I've got to remember not to try to tell you everything tonight. Psalm 81 and 1. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a song and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp, with the psaltery. Bring the instrument so we can give God the glory. This is what David is saying. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. We find it in the New Testament. It says this, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's what we love to quote, but it's really found in the Psalms. And to his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. It comes out of Psalm 100, but you'll hear the New Testament church remark about it quite often. But notice this, verse number 5. I'm sorry, verse number 4. For this was a statute and a law of the God of Jacob. Verse 5, this he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt. Where I heard a strange, I heard a language that I understood not. Now, remember, Joseph is not Jacob. He's the son of Jacob. Joseph is the son who was sold into captivity by his own brothers. I stop to tell you that because I want you who are faithful to God, who want to walk in the righteousness of God to understand. Many of us will be sold out by the brethren. You might as well know it. David put it this way, hey, yay, my own familiar friend. We took sweet counsel together, went up to the house of God together, hath raised up his heel against me. Look it up. I'm not going to tell you everything. But the point I'm making is you're going to fall among false brethren, and you're going to have brethren that turn on you when you want to do right and they don't want to do right no more and don't want to be confronted by you. They have to try to find flaw and put some salt on your name to kill your testimony and influence. And they'll do it. And they'll do it publicly. Then they'll try to play it off and come back to you privately, but they never get it straight publicly. 
Elder Odom said it the other night, and it's the truth. You make a mess of things publicly, you owe it to everybody to see you repent publicly. All this secret, private confession ain't about nothing when the whole world knows you're a whoremonger and an adulterer. What you gonna go in secret and confess for? Folk need to hear you do it openly. You know why? Because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. When we testify that God has covered the foolishness that we laid down in sin with the blood of Jesus Christ, we're living proof that the blood covered because we cease and desist of those things we practice that were not right in the sight of God. In other words, if we were whoremongers, we stop hoeing. We're adulterers, we go back home. Or at the very least, get rid of the extra ones we picked up along the way. And those of you who own your second and third marriage, you might as well hear the truth. You committeth adultery with an ETH on it. Which means as long as you remain in that second, third, fourth, fifth marriage, you remain in adultery. You can't wake up and keep repenting and confessing because you're still going back to bed with the same thing. It doesn't change until you change proximity and situation. Go back to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, for those of you who still believe the Bible. You'll find it gives you no license to go get another one. It tells you if you leave, if you decide to come back, you got to have somebody you can come back to. And you can't come back and be reconciled if the other person went and got them somebody else. That's just more proof you got no business getting a second one, no matter who was wrong. We had it wrong when our fathers taught us that the innocent party can go remarry. That's not Bible. Nowhere. The only person that can go and remarry is the one who married a woman who claimed to be a virgin under Jewish law, and they found out that she wasn't on the night of their bedding because she didn't produce what virgins produce. We ain't marrying virgins nowadays. Let's be real. So except for fornication, fornication takes place before marriage, not after. After marriage, it's adultery. Don't get it twisted. Don't let people fool you into believing you got a license to leave some unfaithful nut job when you can if you choose to, but you don't have a license to go get another one long as that one lives if y'all were married under the blood of Jesus Christ. The foundations have shifted. Preachers are changing their messages because they can make they gotta make allowances for their own extramarital affairs and new spouses. You've been knowing them 30 years and they done had three wives and ain't none of them dead. Ain't there something wrong with that to you? Greedy. But let me get back to what I was talking about. So now I took you to Psalm 81. Watch this one here because this is a typology you can take to the New Testament. So after singing aloud, verse number 4, that was a statue. Verse number 5, ordained in Joseph. Remember, he's the stranger in Egypt who was sold out by his brothers who God made a great man, number 2, in Egypt. And he God used to spare the lives of his family. Verse 6. I removed his shoulder from the burden. Now, what you need to understand is between verses 5 and 6, Joseph went from second in command in Egypt because God gave him the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. And God gave him the headship over Pharaoh's goods and everything Pharaoh controlled, he gave into the hands of Joseph. So Joseph is riding in royalty brings his family and gets them in their own plot of land within Egypt. They came in Egypt free. After a number of years, the Egyptians got slick on them and enslaved them. Egypt is a type of sin. Sin will bring you pleasurable indulgence that looks harmless on the surface until it makes you or takes you hostage and enslaves you. It's like taking one puff or one sip of something that you ought not to ever have touched. It brought pleasure temporarily. But that first pleasure it brought 
it causes a pursuit of the same and it takes more and more of what you tried once to achieve or attain that same level of pleasure you first experienced until you take so much you can't break free. It'll take God to break you free. This is what is happening now in the church of Jesus Christ. They've shifted from preaching the gospel to material things, worldly things. They're enriching themselves and dumbing down the people by not teaching them the whole letter of the word. So ignorant followers don't know that God doesn't allow a lot of the stuff that people are doing. That's why some of you go to these churches where women are the pastors, the bishops, and the leaders. I'm telling you, ain't no Bible for that. And when you go back to, to Isaiah chapter number 3 and 4, you're going to find out. Those same women, they cause the people to go into error. And along with them comes up a group of young people who oppress the older people. Notice how the older leaders are being kicked to the curb left and right. Now I'm starting to enter into the middle between the young and the old. I see the young coming and they're full of vim and vigor and many of them are dumb to the scriptures. I see the old leaving and many of them are being beat down and wore out so much so after they allow sin to creep in that they've lost their voices to resist sin. They can't say anything because somebody knows their dirty little dealings. Well, I don't have that testimony. Feel free to check up behind my walk. It started in Jesus Christ on September the 15th, 1991. You can check with anybody who thought they knew me. Let them tell you what they know about me. Saved or lost. And I'll answer any challenge. Why? Because our testimony needs to be pure before God. I ain't better than anybody, but I'm better off than a whole lot of people. Because I am not allowing the foundations of the truth of the word of God to shift underneath my feet. I'm not going along to get along. And I encourage you to do the same. Incline your ear to the word of God. Please. I'm running out of time. I didn't want to be more than an hour. But let me give you a little more in a few minutes. You got me over here in Psalm 81 verse number 7. Thou callest in trouble, and I deliver thee. I answer thee in the secret place of thunder. I prove thee at the waters of Meribah. Selah. Think on that. So what I was saying is the children of Israel went from free folk in Egypt, brought in by their brother Joseph, who was second in command, to becoming enslaved in the place of Egypt, which is a type of sin. And the analogy is sin will do the same thing to you today. It will trap you in stuff that God never intended for you. And it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will take the grace, the mercy, and goodness of God to extract you from that place that you no longer want to part in. Where you feel the pangs of having stayed there too long. Jesus is the way out. No other way. Jesus is the way out. Verse number 11. Shema. I went too far. Verse number seven, eight. Oh yeah. So if we paused on seven. Verse number eight. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel. If thou wilt hearken unto me, there shall no strange God be in thee. That's what he said. Listen to me. I don't want strange gods in your midst. Neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But, here's the problem. My people, verse number 11, would not hearken to my voice. And Israel would none of me. This is one of the most heartbreaking things we who are preachers of the truth have to endure as pastors and teachers. We warn everybody about the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, and the judgment of God. And folk don't listen. And I can tell you, I've learned through personal experience, you cannot want salvation for somebody else who doesn't want it as much as you want it for them. It just doesn't work that way. 
Everybody's got a choice. And so while these foundations are shifting around what truth is today, you still have a choice to make. You can choose to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost with what I'm giving you tonight and understand that you don't want to be underneath the leadership of a shifting foundation or you can continue feeling good and on your way into a wrong direction that may not end the way you hope it does even though your motive may be pure on the surface. Too many times we've gone after stuff that was not God's will for us. And when we did, we met with the drama and the trauma that could have been avoided if we had only taken heed to the word of God. Why are you saying that, preacher? Look at verse number 12. Please let the dog out, babe. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust. Look here. This is God saying, I warned them. They didn't want to listen. I let them go after what they wanted. What did they want? They lust. And they walked in their own counsels. They did things the way they wanted to. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. God is lamenting that they didn't. And here's the consequence. I should soon have subdued their enemies. You got folk wearing your soul when you backslidden that never would have had as much time to work on you as they do if you had only repented and turned when God called and sent warning. And turn my hand against their adversaries. When you walk away from God, you lose the protection of God. And even in the grace of God, to give you not, the grace not to end up as bad off as you are, there's consequences for transgression. Some of the stuff that we go through subsequent to knowing what's right to do and disobeying it will cost us everything we own in this life. And it might take just that to save our souls. Because some of us, when we get too much, we don't know how to act. Some of us, when we get a little extra, we start to exact our power over others. And you'll know that when you hear things like this. My church, my saints. Know you're following carnal men when you hear my church and my saints. Only thing I got is my gospel, which was committed unto me. And my soul, which I can only say by keeping God's word. Even my wife ain't mine. She's more my sister than my wife as it pertains to eternal life. Won't be husband and wife when we get to glory. Then we will know even as we are known. That's extra. Whole nother teaching. But check this out. Verse number 12. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Then he said, if they had to listen, I'd have helped them. Verse 15, the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. If they had submitted, they could have gone on. 16, he should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock. Should I have satisfied thee. God said, this is the way you could have had it if you had only listened. Let's go to the next chapter. Oh, it gets even better than that in the next chapter. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. The mighty are the strong. The people in power in the churches and in the world, so to speak. He judgeth among the gods with a small g. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? That means give regard to people who are wicked just because of who they are. Why do you think our government and our laws are so crooked? Our laws are being written not by the people that we thought we voted for, but they're written by lobbyists who are writing them to favor them. So when you see our country going to war all over the world, that's because of the military complex. A few folk are making a lot of money over all these weapons that are being made and bought and sold and exchanged all over the world. 
How does America have enough weapons to hand out to other nations? Because we had too many in the first place. How does America pay for all these weapons? They keep increasing the budget of the military spending and it's gone into debt spending. And we keep saying keep our military strong. If our military is strong enough to supply weapons to countries all over the world, don't you think we might have a little too much of something? And then behind that, they go and buy some more. Where is the money coming from this, to get all this stuff? Well, the people who are writing the legislation that these puppets are signing on to, they're the ones getting rich, and they're enriching these puppets. That's why people get into government, become so wealthy. Notice, they're just supposed to be up there handing out a few votes for the benefit of our nation. Where are they getting all this extra money from? Do any of you ever ask yourselves these questions? That if their, their salaries are a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand or even half a million dollars, how do they become billionaires, y'all? Something's wrong somewhere and we're too dumb to ask the questions. But you know the problem? The same is happening in the church today. We've got so many false prophets and charlatans in pulpits singing songs and, and enchanting the people, charming the people, that truth is being avoided, evaded, and misrepresented at the very best. And it's to the detriment of the citizenry of the kingdom of God. So like I said, many of you who are young in the faith, you haven't been alive long enough to know that the church didn't look like this 50 years ago. And since your history comes from something that's online that can be edited by everybody in their mama who still just propagates lies and you don't read natural books anymore, you don't know Jack like you think you know it. You know the narrative that the world is propagating that they make available to you handily. The truth is hidden. They used to have a saying, if you want to keep the people ignorant and if you want to hide something from the public, put it in a book. People don't read books anymore. They're listening to audio books. They're reading online and don't know the lie from a truth because they lack discernment and they don't know history. For those of you who don't know your history, what our country is experiment, experimenting with now with the deficit that we are engaged in as a nation. It's weakening our nation. But if you knew your history, you would know that this is the kind of stuff that weakened Russia, China, and Israel. It weakened the, the Romans, the Greeks. If you knew your history, you will find out that most powerful nations fell behind their own lust, greed, for money and power. They mix the sacred with the profane. Church and state. Crooked priests used to govern crooked leaders of nations. Now you got crooked preachers who are giving ungodly counsel to crooked statesmen. Down here they have a dinner or a luncheon or breakfast I think it is with the governor and they call themselves a coalition of ministers. Most of them cast are not apostolic. So what a godly counsel can they offer to people in leadership? And then the people who are feeding them the breakfast only wants to be legitimized by their presence. I'm the guy who makes a statement by not showing up. I don't want your bacon and eggs. I got my own. And when men sell out, for bacon and eggs. You see them show up on their stomachs, in their faces, and in their messages that they call themselves preaching. It changes. The foundations are shifting. And with that, shifts the faith of those who hear, those who are shifting on the foundations. Watch this here. This is how God deals with it. He says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. I'm back to verse 1, chapter 82 of the Psalms. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hands of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. 
all the foundations of the earth are what? Out of course. These ones who don't do what God said do there. Watch what he says about them. I have said, verse number six, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Seven, but ye shall die like men. Uh-huh, you might live like gods now, including these cats who are in power. Including these cats who rule our government and rule the governments of other nations. Satan is behind all of this stuff that's going on. Don't you understand that? Anything that's standing that's not godly is instigated by the ungodly whose instigator and whose father is the devil. Yeah, the father of lies. Have you met a politician that tells the truth lately? You do like your daddy do. You remember when they used to say you just like your daddy? I'm just like my daddy. My God hates unrighteousness. Uh-huh. But watch this here. He says, I got to hit that verse again. They know not, neither will they understand. Verse number five. They walk on in darkness. These are the ones who are supposed to be preaching and teaching righteousness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high. But notice, being children of the most high does not exempt you from the next verse. But ye shall die like men. Gods are perceived to live forever. The only one that lives forever is Jesus. And then behind that are those who belong to Jesus at his appearing. And at his coming. He appears for the saints, the church, before the rapture. He comes back with the ones that he appeared for at his coming. We come with him. That's when the whole world sees it. And us too. But if you don't know your Bible, you won't be looking for that. He that had the hope of Christ coming back for him purified himself. 1 John 3. Keep reading here. They don't have a clue what's going on. Verse 7, you'll die like men and fall like one of the princes. He says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Look at verse number 11 of the book of Romans, chapter number 2. You thought I was through over there. Let me throw a little more at you. Verse number 11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. You didn't know the law, you're going to die without knowing the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. You lived under the law and you still broke the law that you tried to live under, you're going to die and be judged by the same law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. You got a lot of folk talking, a whole lot of folk listening, a lot of folk hearing but not doing. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Hello, conscience is some kind of preacher even to the laws which show the works of the law written where? In their hearts, their conscience, hello, also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Man, your conscience preaches loud outside of church buildings. God dealt with my conscience outside of church. I had been to many people's churches. I was through with church when God came looking for me again. Through. I don't like hypocrites. I don't like liars. I was one of the biggest liars I ever knew. I would lie on top of a lie and I had to be sharp in my mind to keep up with the lies because I'd lie on the whim. And you know how God dealt with me in my sin? My conscience would worry my soul so at night I talked in my sleep. And man, I told everything I was hiding and lying about in my sleep. Whatever I was doing wrong, I was reenacting it in my sleep, laying next to my faithful wife. Try waking up with your wife leaning over your pillow and saying, who is so-and-so? Boy, I thought I was sharp and quick. I come up with a quick lie. I throw a half-truth in there to throw her off my tracks. My wife wasn't stupid. 
but she believed in the institution of marriage and she stayed faithful to her husband. And we're saved and won't stay faithful nor married. You're not as saved as you think you are. Yeah, I'm almost finished. I'm just going to stop. But notice this here before I stop. Verse number 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Everything you thought you hid from everybody else, God knows. And it will be judged by God. Don't get caught slipping and tipping on these shifting foundations. I pray God give me the grace to come back and pick up where I leave off. I'll stop right there for now. But I want to encourage you, ask your questions. You know they're burning in your heart. Let's get to the end of the whole matter. We must all keep God's commandments. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Thank you for the faithful few who really want the truth and live by it. Have mercy on us all and give us the grace to love you more than this entire world. In the name of Jesus. You're a trooper, Rose. I love you. Hold on to the truth of God's word. If everybody around you lets go, you keep holding on. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. In Jesus' name.